Hi, this is Professor Dorr, and this is lecture number six of EE310. And in this lecture, we're going to cover generalized second order circuits, which is section 8.7 in our textbook, Alexander and Cytico. So we've worked with series RLC and parallel RLC <clears throat> circuits. But now we're going to work with any circuit that has two energy storage elements. In other words, you can have uh, multiple you can have two energy storage elements and they don't have to be in a series or a parallel RLC configuration. And this is the lecture where we cover that and we call them generalized uh, second order circuits. And so what we're going to do is we're really going to augment the procedure that we've been going through in the last few lectures. And to look at how we're going to augment it, let's look at the second order system roadmap. So we went through this roadmap quite a bit in the last lecture, but basically we have our circuit and what we want to end up with is the response as a function of time after t equals zero. Uh, it might be a voltage, it might be a current, and what I show here is that these are the different responses that we might want to solve for. So there are a couple of paths in this flow. Uh, the first path uh, that we'll cover is the specific responses, meaning we want the specific voltage or current uh, at some point or, or node in the circuit. And if we're going to, in order to get that, we need to know three things. We need to know that response at time equals zero plus. We need to know the derivative of the response at time equals zero plus. And we need to know that response at time infinity. And we're going to have to go through this process for each voltage or current that we're asked for. Now, here's the second path. And for this path, I call it the natural response path, because this is where we get the natural response, S1 and S2, um, of, our, of our circuit, or the natural frequencies where it likes to vibrate and whether it's a thud or whether it's a boing. And for this, this process here, the natural response path, it's common to all these specific responses because the type of oscillation and the frequencies of oscillation will be seen at any point in the circuit, whether it's voltage or current or regardless of the initial conditions. And that's why I show here that we're just going to do it once and then it's going to feed into these paths. Now, up until now, we've been working with series RLC and parallel RLC circuits. And so what we've done is we've looked at our circuits, we inspect them, and we get the top topology. And we go, oh, it's a series RLC circuit or it's a parallel. And we use our little toadstools, which are alpha and omega naught. And we call alpha our thuddiness uh, measure and omega naught is our boinginess measure. And those little toadstools work really well for series and parallel RLC circuits. But in the end, what those really do for us is they allow us to get S1 and S2 or omega D if it's a um, if it's underdamped, etc. So alpha and omega naught, we use those when we recognize that we have a <clears throat> series or parallel RLC. But if we don't have one of those, then we call it a generalized RLC. And now we have to do is we have to actually write the differential equations for the circuit and we have to get the, um, the roots of that characteristic equation and those are going to give us our S1, S2, etc. So we look at the topology 
It's series, it's parallel. In this lecture, it's going to be general. We get S1 and S2. Now, after that, everything else is the same. So I want to put this lecture in perspective. So for the problems we worked today, the only difference is this little piece right here. Other than that, everything will be the same. You'll hear in this lecture, I'll say, okay, what are the three things we need? Their response at time equals zero plus the derivative of the response, the response at infinity. That doesn't change from any of our last lectures. What this lecture is about is coming up with those S1s and S2s um, uh, based on our topology. So, our procedure is going to be, of course, we're going to find the response at zero plus, the derivative of the response, and the response at infinity for each specific thing we're asked to find. And then we're going to turn off the independent sources. We're going to use KVL, KCL, whatever we can to write a differential equation for the circuit and we're going to obtain the transient response. Notice how I said these can be interchanged because finding these three things is this. And then finding um, uh, our differential equations are this. And we can do either one first and, or second. And that's why I say they can be interchanged. So now what we'll do to get, get our differential equations is we're going to disable our independent sources, uh, meaning our voltage sources that are on all the time. And then we're going to use KVL or KCL to write um, typically a few differential equations, but then we're going to boil them down into one. And that's the fun part. And from that, we'll get uh, the transient response. And then at the end, we're going to add in the steady state response. Here's our transient response. Here's our steady state response from here. So that's kind of the drill. That's what we're going to do. Now, before I get to this example, um, I want to give you a nice tool that I want you to use on your homework and I want you to jump to it when you're taking quizzes. Um, it's very generalized and it'll work for all these problems because up till now, we've been doing derivations and we've been adding on to things and stuff like that. So you have a lot of little pieces in the last few lectures. But here, let's go down to the end of this lecture. This is the real stuff. This is what you really need to know for your quizzes and your homework. Use this in your homework too. I call this generalized responses. And here's our overdamped case. Here are the three things that we need from our initial and final conditions. And um, what that's gonna, we're gonna combine uh, these with our S1 and S2, we're going to shove them in this matrix. We're going to get A1 and A2. And you can see here that they go right into this equation. So you know S1 and S2. It's overdamped. You know S1 and S2. You know the response at infinity. And you know the response at zero plus. Here's infinity, here's zero plus, and here is the derivative of your response. Shove it into this matrix, get your A1, A2, substitute them into this equation, you're done. Actually, you're not done, I take it back. Then you check it and make sure it's right. Similar drill for critically damped. Here's your general equation. Here's how you get A1 and A2. Here's your underdamped. So here's your general equation. And I showed pieces of the derivation. But here's the deal. 
here's how you get A1 and A2. Don't do this on your quizzes. Just mention that you're using um, the formulas derived in class. So from now on, use these formulas. They'll work for every problem. If you go back to the previous lectures, like um, lecture two and lecture three, you're not going to see the steady state response. It's not going to be in there. So they're not going to give you the right answer. So when you're doing your um, source-free problems, the steady state response is zero. This always works. So this is a really valuable tool for you. And it's right here at the end of, um, of this lecture. So use it for all your homework, use it for all your quizzes, and you'll do much better on it. Okay. So for this problem, we want to find, we say the complete response because that's the transient plus the steady state, but we really want V sub T and I sub T for T greater than zero. So we look at the circuit and we say, is it a, a series RLC? Well, there's the R, there's the L when the switch is closed, because remember, I care about the topology when the switch is closed. Here's my resistor, here's my inductor, here's my capacitor. Ooh, it's got a, <clears throat> it's got a, a resistor in parallel with it. That's no good. So it's not a series RLC. Maybe it's parallel RLC. Here's the capacitor, switch is closed. Here's the resistor, cool. Here's the inductor, ouch. The inductor has a resistor in series with it. So I go, this is not a series and it's not a parallel RLC. What does that mean to me? Nothing changes here. It means that it affects what I'm gonna do in this path. Okay, so let's get our initial and final conditions. And in this problem, we're gonna kind of batch up um, our initial and final conditions. We're gonna get um, the response at zero plus for both the voltage and the current, and then we're gonna get the derivative for the voltage and the current. So we're gonna batch these up. So for our initial and final conditions, looks like I showed these the EE210 way, um, which actually confuses me more than anything else. But at T equals zero minus, this is perfectly valid because the inductor is a short and the capacitor is an open and the switch is open. So here's my equivalent circuit. And so, V at T equals zero minus, um, I'm gonna have no current because my capacitor is open. So we'll use KVL on the fly here and say V is equal to 12. Go down four ohms times zero amps, no voltage across the inductor, I'm at 12 volts and V at zero plus is gonna be equal to V at zero minus. So V at zero plus is 12 volts. That's our initial condition. Um, now let's get our current uh, at T equals zero plus. I'm not gonna use this, I'm gonna use this. So at T equals zero plus, my switch is open, so I got no current here and my capacitor, does not conduct any DC. So I got no current here, no current here. That means I got no current here. So I at zero minus is going to be zero. And since I can't change the inductor current quickly, I at zero plus is going to be zero. Okay, next let's get some derivatives. So we're gonna get dV dt. And so here, I'm drawing just a little piece of the circuit. 
and I know that there was no current in the inductor at t equals zero minus, so I know there's going to be no current in the inductor at t equals zero plus. And I know that this voltage of 12 volts on the capacitor is going to stay 12 volts at t equals zero plus because it can't change the voltage across the capacitor quickly. So I got no current here. I got 12 volts. That means I got to have 12 over 2, 6 amps here. So since it's coming out of the capacitor, the capacitor current is going to be minus 6 amps. And dV dt is I over C is negative 6 over 1 half farad is minus 12 uh, volts per second. Now let's get di dt. So di dt is going to be the inductor voltage V sub L divided by L. And let's see what happens. The capacitor voltage doesn't change at T equals zero, nor of course does our 12 volts here. So at T equals zero, I still have 12 volts here. I have 12 volts here. So I have no voltage across the inductor at T equals zero plus. So VL is zero. So DI DT is gonna be zero over L and it's gonna be zero amps per second. Now let's look at our final conditions. So we did it the 210 way again, and we showed our inductor as a short, we showed our capacitor as an open, we showed our switch as closed, and so what I really see here is just a little voltage divider so the voltage at time equals infinity is going to be 2 divided by 2 plus 4 times 12 equals 4 volts. I is going to be equal to 12 divided by 4 plus 2 is going to be 2 amps. So what I did here is I kind of used um, the EE210 um, um, uh, methodology or you know just the way you show these things the inductor as a short um, of course the little dots show that there's an inductor there it's shorted out um, up here yeah we showed our capacitor is open you may still really want to do that I want to encourage encourage you not to do that but to do everything from the circuit here because it just, for me, it's a lot easier. I look at that capacitor, I know there's no current. I look at that inductor, and I know there's no voltage. That's all I need to know. So I don't need to do this, nor do I need to do this, but you pick what works uh, best for you. Okay, so at this point, let's look where we are on our roadmap. We're asked for two things, which kind of fits nicely with our roadmap because I showed two, and we just did all this stuff. So we're right here. Now it's time to do this. And remember, this is what changes for um, our generalized RLC circuit. So we'll call this step two. And before I start here, uh, I hope everybody remembers uh, my comments about the seagull at Moonlight Beach. Because the seagull, he just pokes around in the McDonald's bags and the garbage bags looking for French fries and half-eaten burgers and stuff like that. Doesn't know whether he's going to find anything, but he kind of trusts his nose to tell him what's in there. And then he, he kind of pecks at the bag and pokes at the bag and... Eventually, he either gets lucky or he, he doesn't. And when I do problems um, for you, I'm never going to be that professor who gets up and vomits problems out and says, well, of course, you can see this is how you do it. Because I don't see how to do it when I start. 
I've worked in industry for 35 years, and I've spent most of those 35 years being confused about stuff. If I'm not confused about stuff, I'm not happy. Um, I need to be confused about things just because I love that. And when I'm confused, I just try things. I write down in this problem, for example, I'm going to just write down things that are true. I don't know where I'm going. I don't see my way to the answer. If this stuff was easy, anybody could do it. So I just start writing things that are true. And eventually, I'm going to end up with enough equations in enough unknowns, or I will have looked at it long enough that I'll go, ah, here's the little piece of insight that I need. And whenever I see that seagull at Moonlight Beach working through the garbage, seagulls doing the exact same thing that I do. It's worked very well for me in my career. And that's why I want to show you how to do it. Not only show you how to do it, but I want to encourage you um, to, um, to accept the fact that being confused is good. Um, when you look at these problems, you're confused. You go figure it out. This whole business of tests and exams gets in the way because you don't want to be confused on an exam. You want to know what you're doing. But that's something I can't change. So we've got this problem here. And what I want to do is determine a characteristic equation, period. When I find the characteristic equation, then I can get S1 and S2. I'll know whether it's critically damped, underdamped, overdamped, all that stuff. So what I'm going to do is just, I have no idea where to start. So I'm going to just start writing equations. Here, I see a big fat node here. So why not write KCL at that node? That sounds fun. So we're going to sum currents uh, leaving the node. So what's this current? Well, it's I. It's what we're asked for. So let's call it I. So minus I plus, oh, we we're asked for V too. That works. V over 2. So voltage divided by 2, that's leaving, plus what's the current here? Let's see, I equals C D V D T. Hey, that's cool. So this current is C D V D T. So I really didn't pay any attention to how many variables I had, but I did kind of try to use the variables that are being asked for in the problem. That's not the case, but in this example, it looked like I could do it. So here's one equation in two unknowns. I can't solve that. Too many unknowns, not enough equations. But if I were the seagull, I would say I smell french fries in there because I got a good equation and um, I have a good equation that is correct. So I obviously need another equation. So let's see. What if I just write KVL in the left mesh? Now, this will be a little new to you guys because you're used to doing all KCL or all KVL. But I'm being the seagull here. I'm just trying to find the answer. So I'm going to write KVL in the left mesh and see what I get. So let's see. 4 times I. That's kind of cool since I is one of the things in my other equation. It's also what I'm asked for, so I kind of like that. 4 times I plus, what's the voltage here? Oh, L D I D T. All right, that works. Plus, what's the voltage here? Well, let's see, it'd be I1 minus I2. Ugh, I can't do that. Oh, the voltage here is just V. It's just V. So I got an equation, and I really didn't pay attention to what all my unknowns were or how many unknowns I have. But now I'll take a look at it. 4i plus LDIDT plus V. So I got one equation here and two unknowns. Here I got another equation. Ooh, it's in the same two unknowns. So what? What? the mathematicians would say is that I have written two linear equations, two linear differential equations in two unknowns. 
so I'm in good shape. What the seagull will say is, there's french fries in there, I know it. I just got to solve these two equations. What I say is, let's go back to where we got those french fries. When I'm trying to set up equations, what I want to do is make line two linear di differential equations, or let's just say two equations in two unknowns. And I know this, this would really offend the mathematicians, but what I'm going to say is to do that, I need to say two different things about the equation, or about the circuit. Two different yet profound things. Or in other words, if I write two equations, but they say the same thing, then the mathematicians will say they're dependent equations. You wrote two equations, but um, your two lines are going to be on a graph. They're going to be like parallel. They're not going to tell me the solution. I need um, to, I need to say two different things. And, and I did that here. I summed the currents, and then I summed the voltage. So everything is looking good here. I have two equations and two unknowns. Um, in industry, I can tell you what I always do at this point, which is I go get a cup of coffee, um, and I take a little break because I like to just know the answer for a little while. That's kind of fun. But here are our two equations. Let's start formalizing them. I'm going to call this one circled number one, and I'm going to call this one circled number two. So now I'm going to look at how to solve them. I could do a lot of things here, but I kind of like this equation here because, look, I got I on one side and I got V on the other side. So what if I take equation one for I and substitute it into equation two? I could take this I, put it here. Here, I'll just take the derivative of this equation. That's easy. And here I'm, I'm left with just, I have my V. So if I do that, it looks like I will be able to get I out of my system. That actually sounds kind of funny, but my system of equations. So what I'm going to do is rewrite equation number two. And you notice my little nomenclature here that <clears throat> has worked really well for me. I describe my equations with my, my numbers. So let's take equation two. It's four times I. Four times I plus L di dt. I can take the derivative of this. This is easy. It's just one half dv dt plus c times d squared v dt plus v equals zero. So this is ugly. No question about this, but it's one equation in un one unknown. To the seagull, what this means is he knows he's found the french fries, but they serve french fries in those little cardboard french fry things. So he's got more pecking to do. So let's peck a little more. I'm going to just start um, gathering up all my terms. And I end up with C D squared V D T plus there are a few algebra steps in here I didn't show, but here's my dv dt terms, here's my v, and now I start shoving in uh, my values. And you might have noticed that I was in no hurry to use numbers. You notice that? I used my, um, well, I used some numbers, I used the four, but I'm generally in no hurry to use numbers until I have things kind of boiled down like this. Because it just, it, it means that I don't have to do a bunch of calculations in here and I don't lose a bunch of precision, et cetera. It just makes it easier for me. So here's my, my characteristic equation. Now I'm gonna put in my value of C, my value of L and stuff. And 
Now I'll multiply through by two, and I have my, my one differential equation. Go back to lecture two if you're not comfortable with how I went from here to here. I mean, what I did is I assumed a solution of e, two solutions of e to the st, and then I took my derivatives and such. But go back to equation one, because there's nothing hard about this, but you can see I kind of just made this jump. And I factored this, and I got my roots of negative two and negative three. And that means my roots are distinct and they're real. So this rascal is overdamped, <clears throat> and this is going to be its natural response. So notice that I could have picked any voltage or current, and I'd get the same characteristic in the same S1 and S2. Let's go to the roadmap. <clears throat> in other words, I could have been asked for any specific response here, but this S1, S2, the natural response path, is common to both of them. Okay, <clears throat> so where we are at this point, let's go back here again. We already got these, we just got these, now we just have to get our A1s and our A2s and fill in our constants. So I said from page two of lecture three, don't do that. Go to the end of this lecture and use those generalized equations. You're looking at them right here. So A1 and A2, here's my matrix. <clears throat> here are our, our initial and final conditions and out pop A1 and A2, and my transient is now this expression right here. I just substituted this in to this equation. Now, so this is for V, and now I'm going to do the same transient uh, response for I. So I know that my transient response will follow this equation, but instead of substituting in the voltage initial and final conditions, now I'm gonna substitute in the current initial and final conditions. And I get, of course, a different A1 and a different A2. Here's my, um, here's my transient response for the current. Finally, I'm going to add in the steady state. And here's my steady state for my voltage that we got up, up, up above. Here's my steady state for the current. I put them in, here are my answers. Am I done? Of course not. I gotta check it. So I know that V of zero is equal to 12 volts. Let's go to our equation for V. At time equals zero, my exponentials become one. And let's see, four plus 12 minus one, sorry, four plus 12 minus four, or four plus 12 minus four is 12. That works. From looking at the circuit, we knew that I of zero equals zero. So let's substitute time equals zero into this equation. We can do it just by looking at it because these become ones, right? At time equals zero, these exponential terms. Two minus six, so we go down six plus four, that's equal to zero. Here it is, two minus six plus four equals zero. Now, I could also check with the derivative of the equations also. And naturally, I could check my final values also by just substituting infinity in here. That's easy. At infinity, this goes to zero and this goes to zero. So V of infinity better be four. 
Similarly, this goes to zero, this goes to zero, I of infinity better be two. I've got checks all over the place. They didn't take me long to do. So make sure you're checking these problems and you're getting good at checking them. Okay, for our next problem, um, we are gonna find VO of T. So we take a look here and we gotta be able to find VO. And here it is, it's nicely described. It's the voltage across the resistor and the left-hand side is defined as the uh, positive and the uh, right-hand side is the negative. So let's identify the topology of this circuit. So let's see. If I'm looking at the topology, I'm going to disable this source. So I see a resistor in parallel with a capacitor. Oh, cool. Maybe it's a, it's a uh, parallel RLC. Hmm, that's not good. It's got two capacitors. So it's neither a series nor a parallel RLC because there's no L in it. So we have ourselves a general, uh, generalized second order circuit. So we want to, what we're going to start with is we're going to go down this path in our roadmap. We're going to figure out the response, the topology, we're going to figure out the response type and the equation structure for our V out of T. And I threw a little hint out, which was um, find V1 and V2, or really just define this as V2, and it'll kind of help um, because it's going to allow us to set up um, uh, multiple differential equations in multiple unknowns. Why did I do that? is I know I have V1 here, so uh, if I wanted, I could have uh, defined I here, but I didn't. I used V2 because I know I want to get the voltage across the resistor. So I could, of course, if I, if I had defined a current here, I could have said, well, the voltage is just the current times the resistance. All those would have worked, but in my case, I decided I would work with V2. So let's just do what the Siegel does and write some equations. Let's see, here's an equation. Just take a look at that for a moment and figure out where it comes from. How'd I get that? Okay, where we got that is from uh, we did a KCL equation up here. So we're going to sum the currents leaving the node. I couldn't, I can always sum currents entering the node, but I chose leaving the node. So V1 minus zero, because remember we're disabling our sources, V1 over one plus, what's the current here? Let's see. Oh, that's going to be C, D, V, D, T. <clears throat> okay, plus C, D, V, D, T. What's the current here? Blech. Too many things. How about if we just say V1 minus V2 divided by R2? So I've got a lot of uh, unknowns here, but is my equation correct? Well, V1 divided by one, that's this current, remember this is zero, plus C D V D T plus V1 minus V2 over R2. Yeah, that's a great equation. But we have to say something else profound um, about this equation. So I'm gonna let you just look at it and think about some of the other profound things you could say. I'm going to use KVL on the fly, and it's going to kind of save me, because if I wanted, I could write a mesh uh, equation around here, um, and it would actually be pretty easy. 
Um, but I'm going to just use KVL on the fly. I'm going to say that um, this voltage, if this voltage plus the current times the resistor gives me V1. So here we go. I know that the current here is going to be C dV dt. That means that's going to be the current here also. So we're going to start at V2, start here, go up the current times this resistance, and that's going to give me V1. And remember, the current here is C dV dt. So start at V2, go up C2 dV dt times R, and I end up with V1. Or in other words, just this voltage plus this voltage drop gives me V1. Now, if I wanted, I could have done this with KVL as a loop. I just would have said minus V1, right? See my, my loop, my mesh current? Minus V1 plus R2I, I, um, plus V2 is equal to zero. So if I don't like this whole KVL on the fly business, I could have done it as a very traditional mesh current. And of course, I get exactly the same equation. So I, now it's time to take stock of things. I have one equation in two unknowns. I got V1 and V2. Now I'm going to look over here. And I've got a very different equation because it kind of came from a different, different um, um, set of conditions there. And it's in V1 and V2. So if I'm the seagull, I'm liking things. So I'm going to give these equations names. Here's 1 and here's 2. And how am I going to go about uh, eliminating a variable? And what I see here, it's similar to the last one. For this equation, I see V1 just sitting here all by itself, um, all by itself. And I know that V1, now V1's not what I'm asked for, but I see V1 all by itself. So what I'll do is I'll just take this V1 and substitute it in here, 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 and here. So it's a lot of substitution, but I know it's going to work. So here we go. Uh, V1 over 1. Here's V1 plus C1 dV1 dt. I just take the derivative of V1 and shove it in. Um, OK, so here's my dV1 dt. And now I have V1 minus V2. So I just put in V1 minus V2 equals 0. And again, I have an equation that only its mother could love it, but it's one equation in one unknown. So now the seagull just has to peck through the cardboard French fry holder, and we're going to get the answer. So we um, combine our like terms. And you can see, of course, I'm in no hurry to use numbers. Sometimes when I grade exams, your numbers just become such a disaster that they confuse and demoralize you on your exams and quizzes. So if you don't have to use them, don't use them. C2 plus C1 plus C2 works for me, and it doesn't make things any different. Ever, any different. So you can see I put it in the form I wanted. Here's my d squared. Here's my d. Here's my v, right? So I know it's in the right form. So now I'll slap the numbers in. 
uh, apparently C1 times C2 gives me one sixth. And yeah, here we go, C2 plus C1. And I get a nice pretty equation. And I now convert that to my characteristic equations, equation singular, and I get my roots, negative one, negative six. These roots, again, like the last problem, are real and distinct. <clears throat> so the circuit response is overdamped, and this is its uh, equation. Where are we on the roadmap? We looked at the circuit and went, ooh, it's a general, and so we just chose to go down this path. We went down this path, we got our S1, our S2, and our equation, so we're in good shape. Now we got to deal with this side here. Okay. So we want V0 of 0 minus and V0 of infinity. And we can get that pretty easily because we're going to see that there's no current in the capacitor at either of these steady state conditions. Remember, 0 minus and infinity, those are steady state. And here's my VO. And I know that at steady state, there's no current in that capacitor. So that means for both of those steady state um, conditions, I got no voltage across this resistor. And so we just write it and we state it. If this is your quiz, say no current at in cap because it's in steady state. Kind of quote the rule for me. Now I have to get DVO DT. This is a little trickier. So let's go up and look at the circuit. DVO DT. When I have a horizontal component like this, or in other words, one of its feet doesn't go to ground, I tend to look at both sides of it. Because if I want dv dt for this, I can take the dv dt here and subtract the dv dt here. And that's the way I always start looking at a horizontal component like this. So let's look at this thing. So at t equals zero, I have um, zero volts at the capacitor. And when I turn on that step, I'm still going to have zero volts at the capacitor. And since I'm zero volts here, I'm not going to get any current or anything going across here because this is just still at zero volts. So the, the so what's going to happen is at t equals zero plus, I got 20 volts here, I got zero volts here, I got 20 amps. And that 20 amps, no current's going to go this way because I got no voltage. So all that 20 amps is going to go into this capacitor. So for the left side, um, my current in C1 is going to be 20 volts divided by 1 ohm is 20 amps. So dv dt on the left side of my resistor, or on the left side of VO, or the positive side of VO, is 40 volts per second. Let's look at dv dt on the negative side of the resistor. Well, I am going to have no current going into the capacitor at t equals zero plus because I got no voltage here. So dv dt on this side is going to be zero. So dv dt for VO is going to be 40 volts per second. Not simple, but straightforward. And just kind of remember my little uh, trick here of when you have horizontal components. 
kind of look at both sides and then you can subtract one from the other. Let's look at VO of infinity. Actually, we already got that because it was easy because we know that infinity, we have no current through the capacitor, so we have no voltage here. So V out of infinity is going to be zero. Okay, and here it all is. Where are we on the road map? We just did this. So now we need to combine the output of this with this and get our final answer. We're going to use our equation for our overdamped system, and we're going to go right to the back of this lecture to our generalized equations, and we're going to use them. And we're going to write down um, our matrix for A1 and A2, and we get A1 is equal to 8, and A2 is equal to negative 8, and we have V out equals 8 e to the minus t minus 8 e to the minus 6 t. Do we see an RS here that adds to this? No, because V O of infinity is equal to 0. Okay, let's move on and let's talk about op amps. Why are we talking about op amps? Because op amps are an integral circuit element in linear system analysis, especially the ideal op amp um, representation, which actually will cover 98% of the op amps that you'll ever see in industry. That's why the ideal op amp that we're going to talk about here is so incredibly useful. But a lot of students come into EE310 and they suffer from op ampitis. It's kind of a strange little disease, but what happens is they look at op amps and they say, oh, that looks too hard. I can't do that. And that stops right now because op amps, if you just look at them right, are really easy. And so what we're going to do is we're going to use op amps throughout this whole class. And I'll come back to these basics anytime you need to see them. And the derivation that I'm going to go through is right out of the first three or four pages of my little textbook, because it's the easiest way I know to pound op amps into your head. This drawing here shows a picture of an op amp. And for our analysis, uh, we are going to treat it as what we call an ideal op amp. Uh, those of you that might be familiar with op amps might say, hey, wait a minute, there's supposed to be a, a power supply terminal up here and a power supply terminal down here. And that's absolutely true. Um, but we're not going to use that for our analysis. Uh, we're going to treat it as just a circuit element. So there are only a couple of things that you have to remember about an op amp. The first one is that no current flows into the inputs V minus and V plus. It has extremely high input impedance. So you don't get any current going in here. That's the first thing. Next, let's what the op amp does is V out is equal to what we'll call the gain times the difference in voltage at these two inputs. Or in other words, V out is equal to gain times V plus minus V minus. And for the ideal op amp, we're going to say that this value of gain is infinite. So now let's use that because that's all we need to know about the op amp. 
but let's derive one quick little thing. Let's say that the gain of the op amp is really a million. Instead of saying it's infinite, we'll say that it's a million. Then if I had like one volt out here, what would be the voltage difference across here? I have one volt at my output. This voltage difference would be one microvolt, wouldn't it? So boy, these two would be pretty close in voltage. Um, let's say that the gain of the op amp is actually a bazillion. And the output is, let's say, 10 volts. Then that means that the difference between these terminals is going to be 10 volts divided by a bazillion, which means it's not going to be very much. Now let's get serious and say the gain of the op amp is infinite. So if the output is somewhere between, let's say, minus 15 and plus 15 volts, which are very typical for an op amp, the difference between these terminals is zero. So we're going to say that when the op amp is connected correctly and working properly, and our op amps are going to be connected properly and working properly in this class, V plus will be equal to V minus. So what we've said is we have no current going into these terminals and the voltage difference across these terminals will be zero when the op amp is, is hooked up correctly in a circuit. So no current flows into the inputs. What might that be useful for? Well, it means that if we do KCL at, at one of these nodes, this current's going to be zero. And if the voltage here is the same as the voltage here, if these were in a KVL loop, there'd be no voltage across them. So let's use that. So here's our basic op amp. And Let's look at this circuit right here. So we know the gain of the op amp is infinite, right? All by itself. But let's get the gain of the circuit. Mean the gain meaning the ratio of the output to the input. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use what I've, I've just learned up here to, to write some equations. Let's do KCL at the inverting terminal right here. If we do that, what do we know? We know there's going to be no current going in here. And also, I'm going to say, since V plus equals V minus, the voltage right here is going to be zero. See that? I'm going to write KCL, but I know some of the answers. I know that there's no current going in here, and I know that my node voltage is going to be zero. So let's write that equation. Vn divided by R1 plus V out divided by R2. And another word, uh, uh, sorry, remember here, this is really Vn, whoops, minus zero, or in other words, Vn minus zero over R1 plus VO minus zero over R2 equals zero. So we do a little math on that. We get V in over R1 is equal to minus V out over R2, and we get gain equals V out over V in is equal to minus R2 over R1. This is a very commonly used <clears throat> configuration for the op amp or circuit configuration. It's called the inverting configuration. Why inverting? Because you got a negative sign right there. It inverts. So it's pretty neat. If R2 over R1 is equal to 2, then the gain of this thing is minus 2. 
I put one volt here, I get minus two volts out. I put five volts here, I get minus 10 volts out. So inverting configuration, very common. Now, when you're taking quizzes, I don't want you to do this derivation. I want you to say that V out over V in is this impedance, negative this impedance divided by this impedance. Let's do another one. This is another commonly used configuration. And so let's get V out over V in. I'm going to use KCL again, <clears throat> but I'm going to take into account the fact that I have no current going in here. And I'm going to take into account the fact that the voltage difference across here is zero. So I know that my voltage right here is going to be Vn. Remember, V plus equals V minus equals Vn. So let's write our KVL. Vn minus zero divided by R1 is equal to V out minus Vn divided by R2. So now let's wiggle those numbers around and we get V out over V in equals the gain equals R2 plus R1 divided by R1. And this is the other very common configuration for an op amp. It's called the non-inverting configuration. Why non-inverting? Because there's no negative sign here. So remember, the gain of the op amp is infinite. The gain of the circuit depends on how the op amp is connected. So when you see an op amp on a quiz, if you can identify this topology of there's some impedance going between the output and the negative terminal, and then another impedance going from the negative terminal down to ground, you notice I said impedance, not resistance, but resistance is just a special case of impedance. Your gain is going to be R2 plus R1 divided by R1 for this circuit. All right, so let's say that, our, that I modify this configuration by making R2 into just a piece of wire, and I just leave R1 out. So if I look here, I just see a piece of wire connecting the output and, and the negative terminal, and there's nothing going down to ground. <clears throat> What's the gain of that? Well, R2 is zero, R1 is infinity, R2 is zero, R1 is infinity, looks like zero plus the same infinity top and bottom, the gain is going to be one. And that's called a voltage buffer, and it's a very common thing for op amps. And wouldn't you know, look what we have right here. So we look at our op amp in this problem, and I can see that it is a non-inverting op amp with R2 equals zero, R1 equals infinity. And you might say, well, why, if, if the voltage gain of this is one, if the voltage here and the voltage here are the same, see I called them both VA, why would we do this? And here's why. Because I can just sniff the voltage here, right? Here I'm just sniffing the voltage because I'm not taking any current. And then I can replicate that voltage here and I can put out all the current I need to. 
So we're going to come back to that as we do this problem. But it has two, the circuit has two energy storage elements. So it's going to give us a second order system. We want to find V out. Is it a series or parallel RLC? Uh -uh. There's no L. So looks like it's going to be a generalized um, RLC. So let's go to our roadmap. Let's do this first. Let's deal with the natural response first. So I'm just going to do like the seagull, and I'm going to write um, some equations. So let's see. I disable my voltage source, and I end up with just my resistor R1 and C1 in parallel. Ooh, what can I say about this? Well, I know there's no current going into the op amp. So can I write a KCL equation here and just say VA minus zero over R1, VA over R1, plus C dVA dt equals zero. Seems like kind of a silly little equation, but um, it's true. So the seagull's pecking away at this thing. Now what we'll do is we know that the gain of the op amp is one. That's why I show VA here and I show VA here. Um, so let's see if we can write another equation. How about, let's see, let's just say, since we're just sniffing this point, there's no current. I know the current in this resistor is the same as the current in this capacitor, right? I know the current is the same. So VA minus VO divided by R2 is equal to C2 dVO dt. See that? I just said these two currents are equal. Now, you could say, well, where did he get that? I want to use KVL. In that case, use KVL. You'll get the same, same equation. You just have minus VA plus C dV dt R2 plus V out equals zero. You get the same equation, do it. Make sure you get the same equation. So again, it's a pretty simple little equation, set of equations here. Didn't start out with much. It had very humble beginnings. But what do I have? I have VA and here I have VO. Let's see, and I want to find VO. So let's see, VA and then VA and VO. Let's see what I can do with this. My unknowns are VA and VO, and I have two of them. So it's looking good, so I'm going to give them numbers and call those my system. And I'm going to say I can solve equation 2 for VA. And there are a lot of different ways you could do this. Um, but let's solve equation 2 for VA. VA is going to be equal to R, R2 C dVO dt plus VO. And now I'm going to substitute that into equation one. So we take our expression from VA, and we're going to substitute that right into our first uh, equation. And so here we have our VA. We put it right there. We divide it by R1 plus C1 dVA dt, right? 
dVA dt. So that means I just have to take the derivative of this VA. And so here is equation one. Here's equation one with equation two substituted into it. And yeah, it's a little bit messy. So what we're going to do is we're going to gather up our like terms so that we have our d squared VOs here, our DVO and our VO over here. And now it's time to put in the actual numbers. So I put all those numbers in. <clears throat> and I end up with our, <clears throat> our differential equation, which is our characteristic equation. And that becomes this equation in S. Again, if you're not comfortable with going from here to here, make sure you go back to, I believe, lecture three on the uh, series, source free series RLC uh, circuit. So now we have S1 and S2, they're negative one and negative five. Let's see where we are. What we've done is gone down this path. Now we're going to go down this path. So we are looking for VO. So VO of zero plus is equal to zero. Let's take a look. So at t equals zero minus, this is going to be zero. And so therefore VA is going to be zero. And this VA, same VA, is going to be zero. Therefore V out is going to be zero. Now let's get dV out dt. So I equals C dV dt. So what we really want to find is just the current in this capacitor at T equals zero plus. Well, when this voltage source turns on, this capacitor is going to be remain at zero volts. That means I'm going to have zero volts here. And that, and I started off with zero volts here, so I'm going to have no current. So I have no current into the capacitor. So dV out dt is equal to zero. Now let's get V out at infinity. So at infinity, this, my 10 volts has been on for a long time and I have no current going in this direction. Therefore, I all, well, I, and I have no current going through this capacitor. So that means I have no current in R1. So my, my voltage here is going to be 10 minus zero times R1 is going to be 10 volts here. That means I'm 10 volts here. I have no current through this capacitor, so that means I have no voltage drop here. So start at 10, go down 0 times R2, I'm still at 10. So V out of infinity is going to be equal to 10 volts. So here we go. We have our initial and final conditions, meaning that we just did this. So we now we just have to put it all together. We know from above that our roots are distinct and real, and so it's the circuit is overdamped. And so we're going to go right to the end of this lecture and pull out our matrix equation for A1 and A2. And here it is. Here are where our initial final conditions go. And here's the matrix that we have at the end uh, of the lecture. We get A1 equals minus 12.5 and A2 equals 2.5.
So now I just shove it right in my equation for the overdamped system. A1 e to the minus e to the minus s1t plus a2 e to the s2t. Sorry, I said minus s1t. It's just s1t. Um, so then I add my final condition here, and here is my output. Um, does my output make sense? Let's check it. We know at t equals zero, the output was equal to zero. So at t equals zero, I am, these exponentials are one, so I'm 10. Go down 12.5, go up 2.5, I'm at zero. We knew that our final uh, voltage at V out was 10 volts. And we know that these are both going to go to zero, so 10 minus zero is 10. So we're in good shape. It looks like we have a good answer. Now, before I leave this problem, I want to just ask, what's the difference between the circuit that we just analyzed and the same circuit but without the op amp? Here's what I'm looking at. We look at this circuit. And we said that this op amp is just a voltage buffer. We have VA on this side and VA on this side. And what if that's the case, what does this op amp even do? Why can't I just replace that with a piece of wire? Because a piece of wire would have the same voltage on both sides. Here's the reason. For our circuit, we have no current right here but we have all the current we want right here. That's why we call this a voltage buffer, because it places this voltage over here, but it can drive all the current that it needs to. And that's why in industry, we call it a buffer. So the diff if we were to put a short circuit here, now, this part of the circuit would load down this part of the circuit because it would accept current. But with our op amp, we can't accept current from here. So it's a very different circuit. Or in other words, this circuit is very different than the circuit without the op amp. So that's just kind of a, a good thing to, to know and also a good little piece of information and intuition about circuits. Okay, so the last two pages of this lecture, the pages that I mentioned up in the beginning of the lecture, which show you all your generalized responses. These equations that are shown on these two pages can be used to solve any Thud and Boeing problem that we've done, whether it's series RLC, parallel RC, RLC, or general RLC. And it all, these also that cover the case where you have um, a uh, the step response, or you have a, um, an energy source in the circuit at time equals infinity, or if you don't, that's what this RS is here. So as you're doing your homework, as you're doing your quizzes, use these equations and just refer to them as you're, uh, when you're doing your quiz. Okay, that concludes this lecture. Uh, I hope to see you all in office hour. Otherwise, I will see you when we do our next lecture.